Welcome everybody. Um, it's lovely to see you all here this evening. And for those of you who have not had the pleasure of meeting, my name's Anne Bell and I'm the University Librarian here at the University. It's a pleasure to have you all here tonight. And of course, it's a real pleasure to welcome back Les to this evening's poetry reading. Um, any sort of recounting of Les's career, I think, will be somewhat surplus to requirements. So I'm not going to go through biographical details and all the rest of it. I think most of you will be familiar with the fact that Les has obviously had a very extensive um, literary career from the 1970s in particular onwards, a long career. Um, but the thing that I did want to draw attention to is something that has really piqued my interest which is, you know, what has Les got in common with Kylie Minogue, <laughs> Paul Keating, and Barry Humphreys? And the answer is that he also, like them, was voted by the people as one of Australia's 100 national treasures. <laughs> and I think that probably sums it up. <laughs> So I have great pleasure in welcoming Les back um, um, this evening. Um, Les visits us regularly, but infrequently, I would say, and it's always a pleasure when he is here. Um, Les is going to read um, from Waiting for the Past, his latest um, publication, um, probably for about 30, 35 minutes, something of that order. And then he's very, very kindly agreed that he will be pleased to answer any questions that you in the audience might have. And my colleague is going to be sort of orchestrating that process for us. So I hope you have a very enjoyable evening and um, enjoy what is to come. Thank you, Les. Thank you. All right. Ah. Well, there was only one <coughs> slight difference in that uh, in that introduction. I figured tonight I wouldn't read to you from uh, the latest book because I think I thought I've been reading from that book a lot, and <laughs> may, maybe it's getting a bit worn. You know, it uh, it, it wants a rest. So I'll read from all the things which will gradually come up and catch it as it's running away, you know? <laughs> uh, and so I've stuck all these, all these bits of paper in here and uh, the oldest poem in the lot tonight that I'll read to you comes from the year 1976. And it's called Driving to the Adelaide Festival, 1976, via the Murray Valley Highway. Egg. And that, there we are, right. A long, narrow woodland with channels, re-entrance, ponds. The Murray's a mainstream with footnotes, a folklorous river. The culture on both banks is pure Victoria. The beer, the footy, the slight earnest flavour, the cray. Some places there's man-made conventional width of water studded with trunks, a cold day in the parrot's high rooms. Walking on the wharf at Echuca, that skyscraper roof, 60 feet down timber to a dry season splash. In the forest there are sudden cliffs, dusky silton, silken water, moving away with the live blow, the live Flow is barnacle green. Billabongs are pregnant with swirls and a sunken road of hyacinth leads to an eerie noonday corner. Ships rotting in the woods, ships turning to silt in blind channels. One looked like a bush pub impelled by a combine header. Out in the wide country, channels look higher than the road, even as you glance along them. Salt glittering out there. Romance is a vine that survives in the ruins of skill. Inside the horizon again, a restored steamboat puffing. Thinking at speed among lakes of a time beyond Denham in the gardens of that time. Night gardens, fire gardens, crazed wood, brushed chars, powder blue leaves. Each year the purists would ignite a fresh a barbecue with a beer bottle lens, a tossed bumper. 
Heading for the tent for a tent show, thinking stadium thoughts. A dense bouquet showing the van through the province of Sultanas. This is from a series of machine portraits. And they're big machines. I like big machines. For some reason, my wife likes big machines. And she said, write me some of those really big uh, <laughs> machines. So this is a bulldozer. The bulldozer stands short as a boot on its heel-high ripple, ripple soles. It has to toe-capped stumps aside all day, scuffed earth and trampled rocks, making a hobnail dike downstream of raw clay shoals. Its work will hold water. The man who bounced high on the box seat exercising levers would swear a full frontal orthodox oath to that. First he shaved off the grizzled scrub with that front end safety razor supplied by the School of Hard Knocks. Then he knuckled down and ground his irons properly. They copped many a harsh rub. At knock off time, spilling thunder, he surfaced like a sub. And there was a there was a crane driver I knew for a while called Sweeney. Sweeney had a good crane and he used to flatten cars with it. And uh, he had this, this uh, stanza of my poem stuck up in the, uh, in the cab because he was very fond of the, uh, the stanza. No riddles about a crane. This one drops a black clangor on cars and the palm of its four thumb steel hand is a raptor of wrecked tubing. The ones up the highway hoist porridgey concrete, long spars and the local skyline. Whether raising aloft on a string bizarre workaday angels or letting down a rotating man on a sphere, these machines are inclined to maintain a beast like world war in which we turn over everything to provide unceasing victories. Now the fluent lines stop and strain engrosses this tower on the frontier of junk, this crane. I don't know what happened to Sweeney in the end. <laughs> Oops. It wasn't, wasn't this. It's a, this poem is called Letters to the Winner and it's like most of my work, it's a true story. Letters to the Winner. After the war and just after marriage and fatherhood ended in divorce, our neighbour won the special lottery. An amount then equal to 15 years of a manager's salary at the bank, or 50 years earnings by a marginal farmer for mending his clothes in the black marmalade, mar marinade of sweat up in his mill logging paddocks. The district used to one mailbag, now received two every mail day. The fat one was for our neighbour. After a dip or two, he let these bags accumulate around the plank walls of the kitchen over the chairs. Tilt. On a rainy day, he fed the tail-switching calves, let the bullocks out of the yard, and pausing at the door to wash his hands, came inside to read the letters. Shaken out in a vast mound on the kitchen table, they slid down, slithered to his fingers. I have seven children. I am under the doctor. If you could see your way clear, equal partners in the venture, God would bless you, lovey. Assured of our best service, for a mere 15 pounds down, Remember, you're only lucky I knew you from the paper straight away. Backsheesh, hissed the pages as he flattened them. Backsheesh. Mate, if you're interested in a fellow digger's problem, old, old mate, a friend in need. The great golden letter having come, now he was being punished for it. You sound like a lovely big boy. We could have such times. Here's my photo doll. I'm wearing my birthday swimsuit. <laughs> for the, the right man, I would share this infallible system. When he lifted the stove's iron lid and started feeding in the pages he'd read, they clutched and streamed up the corrugated black chimney shaft. And yet he went on reading, holding each page by, in, by its points, feeling an obligation to read each crude rehearsed lie, each come on, flat truth, extremity. We might visit you, the wise investor alone, a bushman like you. Remember we met on Roma Street for your delight and mine, a lick of the Sultana? The white moraine kept slipping its messages to him. You will be accursed. He hussed them like cobs. Mr. Nubo Jack, old man, my legs are all paralysed up. Black smuts swirled weightless in the room. Some good, kind person, 
like, a noise, like the noisier of a novice free falling in a deep mine's cage. Now I have lost his pension and formed a sticky nimbus round him. But he read on, fascinated by a hum further human range not even war had taught him, nor literature glossed for him since he never read literature. Merely the great reject pile which high style is there to snub and filter for readers. That his one day's reading had a strong taste of what he and war had made of his marriage is likely. He was not without sympathy. But his leap had hit a wire through which the human is policed. His head throbbed as if busting with a soundless shout of immemorial sobbed invective, God forsaken, God forsaken, as he stopped reading and sat blackened in his riches. Better get out of my watch at this point. Yeah. Yes. Okay. This poem is called Shale Country. Watermelon rinds around the house, small gondolas of curling green lined with sodden rus rosy plush, concrete paths edged with kerosene, tricycles and shovels in the yard where the septic tank makes a fairy ring, a wire gate leads into standing wheat, cream weatherboard overlaps everything. And on the wheatless side, storm blue plaques curl off the spotted gum trees, which in new mayonnaise trunks stand over a wheelbarrow on its hands and knees. <coughs> Aerial, upward, cheeping, on huddling wings, these small brown miners have gained a keener height than their kind ever sustained. But whichever of them falls first, fails first, falls to the hawk circling under, who drove them up. Nothing's free when it is explained. Uh, one time in my life I was <clears throat> badly afflicted with a disease called depression. I didn't like myself much and didn't like the other people too much either. So I mostly addressed myself to the to animals and birds. And uh, uh, it helped, it helped. This poem is called Shoal. I and I, I and I, each, what blinks is I, unison of the whole shoal, thinks a dark idea circling by, Again the eye's eye winks, eye and eye near no eye is no eye. Though gu gill pulse drinks and nervy fins spacewalk, jinx jets the jettison back into all, tasting each being a tongue, vague umbrations of chemical, this way thrilling, that way wrong. The pure all was inimical, compound being even the sheer thing I suspend eye in and thrust against for speed and feeding. All eye blades for the ears wave gust over curryfish's unpressured beading for bird dive boom, red fins gaped gong. If you got that at the first hearing, you'll be doing well. <laughs> <laughs> took me took me a while to get it on the on the first writing. <laughs> this one is not like that at all. This is uh, part of the invasion of Australia by other civilizations was uh, all the other animals we'd never had before. And one of the great uh, uh, leading creatures who came into Australia and conquered it were, were uh, cattle. And cattle are the animal I know best of all. I can't come from cattle world. And uh, this poem is called Cattle Ancestor, written in the imitation, I suppose, of a, an Aboriginal um, uh, song. Cattle Ancestor. Durham, Borley and all his wives, they came feeding from the southeast back in that first time. Darren Borley is a big red fella, terrible fierce. He scrapes up dust, singing, whirling his bull roarers in the air. He swings them and they sing out crack, crack. All the time he's mounting his women, all the time more kulka, 
more, more, smelling their kulka and looking down his nose. Kangaroo and emu mobs run from him as he tears up their shelters, throwing the people in the air, stamping out their fires. Darren Borley gathers up his brothers, all making that sad cry, ma, ma. He initiates his brothers, the bullock truck. They walk head down in a line and make the big blue ranges. They hear their clinking noise in there. Darren Borley has wives everywhere. He has to gallop back and forth, mad for their kulka. You see him on the coast and on the plains. They're eating up the country, so the animals come to spear them. You have to die now, you're starving us. But then Wark, the crow, kills Durham Borley. Your wives, they're spearing them. He is screaming, frothing at the mouth. That's why his chest is all white nowadays. Jerking two knives, he screams, I make the new water holes, I bring the best song. He makes war on all that mob, raging, dotting the whole country. He frightens the water snakes, they run away, they can't sit down. The animals forget how to speak. There is only one song for a while. Durham Borley must sing it on his own. Late summer fires, the paddocks shave black with a foam of smoke that stays, welling out of red-black wounds. In the weight of a drought this happens, the hard court game. Logs that fume are mostly cattle, inverted, stubby. Tree stumps are kiln, walloped, wiped, hand pumped. Even this day rolls over slowly. At dusk, a family drives sheep out through the yellow of the Aboriginal flag. And this uh, was a time of bad luck for, uh, for farmers when I wrote this one. It's called The Rollover. Some of us primary producers, us farmers and authors, are going around to watch them evict a banker. <laughs> It'll be sad. I hate it when the toddlers and wives are out beside the fence crying and the big kids wear that thousand-yard stare common in all refugees. Seeing home desecrated as you lose it can do that to you. There's the ute piled high with clothes and old debentures. There's the faithful VDU, shot dead, still on its lead. This fellow's dad and granddad were bankers before him. They sweated through the old hard inspections, had years of brimming foreclosure. But here it all ends. He lent three quarters and only asked for a short extension, six months. But you have to line the drawer somewhere. You have to be kind to be cruel. It's Sydney or the cash these times. Who buys the legend of the bank anymore? The laconic teller, the salt of the earth branch accountant. It's all an owned boy's story. Now they reckon he's grabbed it. He grabbed a gun and an old coin sieve and holed up in the vault, screaming about his years of work, his identity. Queer talk from a bank, Johnny. <laughs> We're catching flack too from a small mob of his mates, inbred under manager types, here to back him up. <laughs> Troublemakers, loud land of spoiling white trash, it'll do them no good. Their turn is coming. They'll be rationalised themselves, made adapt to a multinational society. There's no room in that for privileged traditional ways of life. No land rights for bankers. It got, that one I was rather proud of, it got into every copy of The Australian for, for a few weeks. <laughs> Not on the wall of a few banks. <laughs> we used to have a mountain up home between Newcastle and Taree, um, called Ayers Rock. But that got changed, it's, uh, it, it used to be out in uh, Central Australia and that got changed to, um, uh, what do they call it now? Um, Uluru. So we moved uh, Ayers Rock into uh, our part of the Pacific Highway. And you'll find it up there if you go looking. 
It's called Inside Airs Rock. Inside Airs Rock is lit with paired fluorescent lights on steel pillars supporting the ceiling of haze blue marquee cloth high above the non-slip pavers. Curving around the cafeteria throughout vast inner space is a milky way of plastic chairs in foursomes around tables all the way back to the truck driver's enclave. Dusted coolabar trees grow to the ceiling. TVs talk in gassy colours and round the walls are outback shop fronts, the beehive bookshop for brochures, casual clobber, the bottle country kitchen and the sheet iron dreamtime experience that is turned off at night. <laughs> a high bank of metal ribbony lolly jars presides over island counters like open crates, one labelled white mugs and covered with them. A two-dimensional policeman discour discourages lifting of, shoplifting of gifts and near the entrance where you pay for fuel there stands a tribal man in rib paint and pubic tassel. It is all gentle and kind. In beyond the children's play world there are fossils, like crumpled old drawings of creatures in rock. Oops. That uh, uh, microphone doesn't like me. I've never been much good at uh, popular music, but I did write one poem on a school of music that uh, oh, a bit out of fashion at the moment. My wife knows a lot about it. Called, it's called uh, Tin Pan Alley or Timpan Alley, if you like. Timpan Alley. Adult songs in English, avo avoiding schmaltz, pre-twang, the last songs adults sang. When rolls and manners wore their cuffs as shot as Ortega y gussets, Soloists sang as if a jeweller raised pinches of facets for hearts as yet unfazed by fatty, by fatty assets. Adult songs with English, the brilliantine long play records of the day sing of the singlish. The arch from rye to rue of marks just, and just one angle, blue that Dietrich played, euphemism's last parade. With rhymes still on our side, unwilling to divide the men from the poise of lacquer days and lacquer toys. And always you, cool, independent you, unsnowable, au oh, fay, when us were hotly too, not lost in they. <laughs> a Lego of driving to Sydney contains, it's a poem about travelling from anywhere in Australia to Sydney, between about the years 1830 and, uh, oh, 2000, uh, various forms of reaching Sydney uh, over the other uh, decades. A Lego of driving to Sydney. Dousing the campfire with tea, you step on the pedal and mount whip high behind splashboard and socket. Your burnished rims tilt and rebound among bristling botany. Only a day now to the port, to bodices in the coffee palace to metal shying razors in suits and bare ships towing out to dress and concentrate in the wind. Motoring down the main roads, fenced wheel track choices in forest, old scored beds of gravel, not wood in the ground. You will have to wrestle hand and foot to reach Sydney and win, e win every fall. River punts are respites. Croak, oak, the horse dung roads aren't scented anymore but tasted. Paved road starts at Chatswood. Just one ferry then to stringing tram cars and curl the mo to palms in the wonderful hotels. Blazing down a razorback in slab dark in a huge American car of the chassis age to rescue for pleated cushions a staring loved one who'll sway down every totter of the gangway on cane legs. Petrol coupons had to be scrounged for this one. They have seen too much railway. Queuing down bloody highways all round east are crawling into the great herb sandstone bowl of tea leaf scrub and suburbs, hills by Monier and Wonderlick in kiln orange with cracks of, of harbour, coming down to miss the milking on full board with baked Sundays, life now to be neat and dry-eyed, coming down to be gentrified. One long glide down the freeway through automatic radar zones, Soaring Egyptian rock cuttings, 
Bang into newsprint coloured rainstorm, tweeting the car phone about union shares and police futures. Driving in in your thousands to the show, to be detained half a lifetime, to grow rental under steel flagpoles, lapping with multicoloured recipes. I remember when we were walking to school over the hills and we were uh, of that sort of age, 9, 10, 12, um, asking each other, what was the end of our life going to be like? This was the one end of it, this was the beginning end, what was the, the end, end end going to be like? And I wrote this poem called The Disorderly. We asked, how old will you be in the year 2000? 62, 60, 59 unimaginable. We started running to shin over the slip rails of a wire fence. You're last. It's all right, I'll be first in heaven. And we jogged on to school past a yellow flowering guinea vine. Cattle stood propped on the mountain. We caught a day blind glider, glider possum and took him to school. Only later at the shoe wearing age of the, edge of the world did we meet kids who thought everything ridiculous. They thought us incredible. Cream-handed men in their towns never screamed Christ to Jesus as the hills with diabetes breath nor talk fight or scotch poetry in scared timber rooms. Such fighters had lost, we realised, but we had them to love or else we'd be mongrels. This saved our, our souls later on, sometimes, crossing the cousinless detective levels of the world to the fat-free denim culture, that country of the attitudes. small flag above the slaughter. Perhaps a tribal kinship, some indigenous skinship, is equivalent to the term our neighbour saw fit to award to his amiable then fit cuckholder, now sick whom he nurses. He is my husband-in-law. Well, whatever page that was, it's gone. <laughs> clothing as swilling, oh, sorry, clothing as dwelling as shouldered boat. Propped sheets of bark converging over skin oils and a wintry fire. Stitched tides of a furry rug cloak with their naked backs to the weather. Clothing as dwelling as shouldered boat, beetle backed with bending ridge lines. All this resurrected and gigantic. The Opera House, Sydney's Aboriginal building. The Chinese, for some reason, in their culture don't like. Uh, um, what do you call it, uh, mincing. They don't have mincing machines. They like to chop up meat. And so I, I used to like standing outside a certain shop in Chatswood and watching the man in the window chopping up the meat for the, uh, the, the courses I intended to eat. <laughs> the Great Cuisine Cleaver Dance Sonnet. <laughs> juice, wet black, juice wet black steel rectangle with square bite. Dock pork, slice, slice, candy pork, mouth size, heel and toe work walk through greens, wad widths, block duck, bisect bone, facet glaze, nick snake, slit wriggle, take gallbladder, whop garlic, shave lily root, wham, clay chicken cr crust, hiss wok, plug flare, circling soy, cringing prawn, blade amassing, sideways mince.
in a time of cuisine. A fact the gourmet euphemism can't silence. Vegetarians eat sex, carnivores eat violence. <laughs> The insiders. What's in who for you? Who's in you for himself? <laughs> At university, Puritans reckoned the cadavers in anatomy were drunks off the street. Idealists said they were benefactors who had willed their bodies to science. <laughs> But the averted manila coloured people on the, on the tables had pinned back graves excavated in them, around which they lay scattered in the end, as if exhumed from themselves. This is just the last two stanzas of a poem I tried to write about music. I'm not very good at writing about music, but uh, I think I got this bit. The weight of our weight, the weight of our years, the said, the the said and the shed and the stammered in tears, and always this broadcast other world in our ears. Then will be a tune they'll put on and play, bits of and rarely, till our times pass away, and there's no one on earth who knew us by heart, obsolete for all time, and that's just the start. Twelve little short poems. I used to write too long, so now I write too short. <coughs> Twelve poems. That wasn't horses, that was rain yawning to life in the night on metal roofs. Lying back so smugly phallic, the ampersand in the deck chairs of itself. Fish head down in a bucket, wave their helpless fan feet. Spirituality, she snorted, and poetry, they're like yellow and gold. Being rushed through the streets at dusk by trees, trees and rain, the equinoctial gales. The best love poems are known as such to the lovers alone. Creek pools, grown top-heavy, are speaking Silver Age verse through their gravel beards. Have a heart, salted land is caused by human tears. Tired from understanding life, the animals approach man to be mystified. A spider walking in circles is celebrating the birthday of logic. <laughs> to win me, they told me all my bad attitudes, but they got them wrong. Filling in a form, the simple man asked his mother, Mom, what sex are we? There's a lot of poems about dying, and few, few enough about being born. I uh, couldn't remember exactly how it went, but I inquired of various people who'd been closer to it than I, <laughs> and I uh, wrote this poem called Birthplace. Right in that house over there, an atom of sharp spilled my sanctum, and I was extruded, brain cuff, in my terror, in my soap. My heart wrung its two already working hands together, but all the other animals started waking up in my body. The stale water frog, the starving worm, my nerves not worked globe was filling up with panic writing. Bat wings in my chest caught fire, and I screamed in comic hiccups, all before focus in the blazing cold. Then I was replugged amid soothe onto a new blood that tasted. Nothing else intense happened to us in this village. My two years school time here were my last in my own culture. 
the one I still get held to in this place in working hours. I love the rye equal humane and drive in to be held to it. Bright lights on earth, luminous electric grist brushed over the night world, white Korea, dark Korea, tofu detailing all Japan, Bangkok on a diamond saddle, snowed in Java and Bali circled by shadow isles, Cairo in its crushed ice coop, dazzling cobweb Europe that we've seen go black. Now the street lights don't switch off for wars. The past is fuel of glossy continents. It rims them in stung salt. Australia in her sparsely starred flag hammock. Human light is the building whose walls are inside. It bleeds the planet. But who could be refused the glaring milk of Earth? Industrial relations. Said the conjurer, could I have afforded to resign on the spot when you ordered me to saw the fat lady in half before payday? I would have. I find wage, wage cuts sorted. Definitions, effete, a pose of pal palace cavalry officers to, in plum Crimean fig spurs and pointed boots. Not, all, not at all the stamp of tight-buttoned guards executing arm geometries in the shouting yards, but sitting his vehicle, li listening to tanks change gears amid oncoming fusiliers, one murmurs the style that has carried his cohort to this day and now will test them. You have to kill them, Giles. You can't arrest them. <laughs> uh, that's the last piece of paper, if I can read it. Yeah, this is the last one. We've reached it just on uh, half past six. Uh, timing was right. Um, there's a, a, an island at the, at the end of the, the Thames looking out towards Europe. I was out there one day and uh, discovered a road called Sexburger Drive. It's just a, a mud road going up a steep hill. And I wrote this poem a little while later. Boris, uh, the mayor of London, had been proposing moving Heathrow Airport out of Heathrow and down to uh, the mouth of the, uh, the Thames out into the, the North Sea. And I thought it was a rattling good idea. So put it together and the result was a frequent flyer pr proposes a name. Sexburger Drive is a steep mud lane. But Sexburger, she was Queen of Kent 14 centuries ago. She tried to rule as well as reign. But her tough spear thanes greater, no, she's but a woman, a, a loaf nether, will not obey her and bodice feed her. No president, said Witan, quite unkent. So on Sheppy Isle she built a convent. But now in an era more um, Amazon, the notion has come to the Jarl of London, white pole Boris, to move Heathrow out to the marshy Thames outflow. So jetliners may leave their curling, their keening cry out over the channel and grim North Sea. And Celtic queens are ruled, Bodica, Bess, but your Saxon ones still await redress. So savour this name, London Sexburger Airport. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>